So if question. you have any questions about the afternoon lectures, I'd ask them now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, th there, there's some literature that says that procalcitonin seems to be pretty good at predicting who doesn't benefit from antibiotics for acute lower respiratory tract infection. And people have used a procal cutoff of 0.1 or less usually. And that's about the only place where it's been really, really well supported, right? As I said. But not for lack of trying. Not for lack of trying, because everybody's tried to apply procalcitonin to everything in the world. Um, and, and I don't think it's ready for prime time yet because we know that it's not as reliable in patients, for example, with liver disease and renal disease, right, which is a huge share of the people we see in whom we might be interested in sparing them antibiotics or figuring out if all the stuff that's wrong with them is really due to an infection. The other place that people seem to like doing this, and I have one colleague who, if I know he's coming on the day after me, I just start ordering the ProCal daily, you know, <laughs> that it is in the ICU, there was, yeah. a, there was a, a paper and a subsequent presentation at SCCM where they said, hey, the cool thing about procalcitonin is that the elimination half-life in people who are getting better is about a day, right? So you should expect your procalcitonin cut in half about every day if you're getting better, your antibiotics are working, et cetera. Now, I have one colleague who swears by this, and he loves to follow daily ProCal. I'm not sure that's terribly helpful, uh, you know, because you know, I guess the question is, if it doesn't go down by a half, are you going to add a new antibiotic in somebody where you have all other kinds of data to guide you, right? Their clinical appearance, the micro that you sent, the blood cultures, whatever, probably not, right? And I always t tease the residents, you know, you got some transplant patient who comes in, they're not feeling well, and they look like they're in septic shock, and they send a procalcitonin, like, what, you know, if it's flat, are you going to not give this person vancomycin and piptazo and, you know? No, probably not. So I think pneumonia outpatient uh, c maybe has some support. We talked about the PROACT study that says if you have clinical equipoise, your judgment as an ED provider seems to be just as good as information about an unblinded procalcitonin level in the ED. And for everything else, the jury, I think, is still out. Okay. How about this worst headache of my life <laughs> comment? Oh. Yeah, so I, 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 I responded to that. I don't ask patients don't if either. it's the worst headache of their life. What no. I do is when a patient comes in and the chief complaint is headache, I start by saying, how often do you have headaches, right? And then they'll say, oh, not that, very, not, not that often. I said, okay. I said, well, is it once a week, once a month, once, you know, how often? And they'll be like, oh, once a week, right? So now patient coming in with a headache who typically gets a headache once a week. Right? It's a very different story than like, I get one headache, this is the worst headache I've ever had. And I said, okay, well tell me about your usual headache. What does it feel like? Where do you get it? Well, where do you have a headache now? They're telling me to have it on the same side. Okay, do you normally get nausea and vomiting with it? Yes, I do, they're vomiting now. So I'm painting more of a picture of what their headache is like. And at some point, you know, I'll say, well, how does this compare to your other ones? And they'll be, and they'll be like, oh, well, my, my migraines are worse. This isn't like my migraine, not the worst headache of life. Right? Because if you ask people, is this the worst headache, like half of them are going to be like, oh yeah, absolutely it's the worst headache, right? So I, I, I think that those kind of questions are very dangerous. I think the key is also just asking them how it's different. That is, that's the key question. How right. is it different? I like how your initial approach, great. Um, but the key is why, what, why are you here today? What's different about what's happening? Um, and that's sort of a better question than, is this the worst headache of your life? Right, and what's there are two studies that looked at this, one where you prompted them and one where the patient offered it up. So if the patient comes to you and their first things out of their mouth is, man, this is the worst headache I've had in my well, life. Well, there you go. And that, and that group, when they looked at that group, a very significant proportion, over 10%, had some serious cause of that headache. So if the first words out of their mouth were, this is the worst headache I've ever had, that to me is, I, I worry. I worry or, about that. Or if the triage nurse writes, yeah. a, writes oh, a note. Man. In all complaint. caps. Worst headache of life, patient Worst eating slice of, of pizza. Life. Yeah, right? and guarantee <laughs> you're, like, you're definitely screwed. taking you're selfies in the screwed, ER. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no way you're getting out without a lumbar puncture there. I think that question is a lot like the pain scale. You ask them what their pain scale, one to 10, and they say, oh, if I get a little number, they're not going to give me any pain medicine. As long as they say it's 11. You know, so, so they'll be sure say to get eight, it. Say yeah. eight, and you know what, everybody. The reason I'm in the emergency room is there's a horse head in my life. And everybody always has their thing that they say, like my thing is when somebody's like, how bad is your pain? They're like, oh, it's like a nine. I said, oh, or they're like, it's a 10. I was like, okay, if a 10 is being stabbed with knives and lit on fire at the same time, I was like, 
you know, w what is your pain? They'll be like a 10. I'm like, so if somebody just started stabbing you right now and just lit you on fire, you'd be like, nah, I'm fine. There's no difference to my pain. So, you know, <laughs> you know I, li I like giving Childbirth. those comparisons at times, you know, sometimes. But <laughs> if a nice. patient says to me, um, yeah, my pain's a nine, like that, I go, really? Is it, re is it really? And they're like, Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's more like a five. Oh, I tell you, any woman who's had a baby, just compare it to having a baby. Yeah, that too. And if it's like, oh, no, 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 this is fine. So <laughs> you have to remember, though, if you think it's a migraine headache that they're talking about, there is, is an increased risk of cell arachnoid hemorrhage in people who have migraines. So you have to be careful that you don't, this may be the worst migraine they've ever had because it's a subarachnoid. But it's different then. Right, that's right. why if you they, ask. Right, if they're telling you that, I would take it very seriously. Yeah. Well, uh, all right. So. Next question. Next. I want to just move down to some of um, these other questions here because there were, ooh, you know what, since you guys are all up here, how does the panel of ED docs feel about PAs, NPs in the ED setting? Do they add value to the department? Are they a liability? And, can, and how can they be best utilized? <laughs> You wrote that question. I you? swear to God, I did not. You was a nice and weekend. anonymous. I feel you. like you did. Nice oh, and nice. Just like should Aaron have his own podcast? Who wrote that question? No. Oh, no. Know. I'm only kidding, actually. You know, we, it would be nice if we could turn this into a little podcast, right? We can, if you want to live stream this later, you certainly can, but that'll eventually disappear. But maybe, maybe they got something out there for you, Aaron. Mm. There's no question that PAs and MPs are rapidly on the rise in, in all fields of medicine and particularly in emergency medicine. And I think that's good. They, they do as, as well as most doctors do on most things. The problem is that uh, it's a threat to the doctors. Uh, they're losing their jobs to them because you can hire three PAs for one doctor cost, and uh, they can see all the fast track patients where the doctor was spending his time suturing. So the older doctors are nasty to you guys because they see you as a threat to, the, to their, their, uh, their livelihood, and you're taking their jobs, which you are. Uh, but uh, you know, I think you're in a tough, a tough part of your field because you're growing so fast, uh, and the hospitals are taking you on so quickly. Uh, you know, if I were still, you know, in an ER and, and they brought in five PAs and they say, well, you know, Dr. Roberts, we really not need you as much anymore. Uh, I'd be, I'd be very critical of that. So. Well, that's it, and there's a couple other things too. I think PAs and NPs are fine. I think there, there's a division of labor that we are just swamped in the emergency department. I think it's fine. I think the thing though is. There's a reason that it takes a while to get good at what you do. And what we do is very undifferentiated, right? People come <coughs> to the door and you have no idea what's coming. And so there's some benefit to experience with supervision so that you know what you know and you learn what you don't know. I think part of the problem with getting thrown into a situation is you don't know what you don't know. So you stick within your pool of, of decision-making choices. Um, and so I, and I honestly think that medicine has is, is been problematic, emergency medicine, and throwing people into an emergency, I'm sure have many of you in this room have been in a situation where it's like, I am so over my head, but what do I do about this? You know, how, what do I say about this? It's for the patient's benefit for me to ask a question, but I don't feel comfortable asking questions. And so part of it is we have not been very good stewards of this change in general. Um, and there are now fellowships and there are now supervision things that are finally happening, thank God. But I, I apologize <coughs> for emergency medicine in general to those of you who are put in situations that you felt uncomfortable with because we were not very good stewards of that. I think anyone can be good at this job, but all of us need to be adequately and appropriately trained. You know, when emergency medicine first started, I was, I was one of the first graduates of the country. And I can tell you the surgeons hate us. You're putting in a chest tube? Anesthesiologist oh, you, did, you, right? I'm gonna Still testify student. against you in court if, exactly. if you have a problem from intubating a patient. You know, this is, this is how, it, how it came out because we were taking their, their procedures job. and their jobs. But you know, and, the, and then the question about liability, right? There's always increased liability when you yourself is not doing the thing, right? That you're putting your name on, right? And that will always be true because you don't, can't control all the elements. But that's why I think it's so important to have good relationships and good teams, yeah. right? You have to have open communication. You can't be, if you are a supervising physician, you, you can't be the one who's like, I don't want to hear it or gets mad or gets angry and feels like it's more work. You need to be approachable, right? And I, I think everybody wants to work with approachable supervisors and really no matter what your job is, right? And that's how you decrease liability. That's how you decrease the risk. So I, I think it's important. I think the other thing about the, about the risk piece too, right? And uh, that I don't think anybody's mentioned yet is that like I love working with PAs and NPs because I work in a teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. And I worked with the PAs and NPs for several years and they know what the heck they're doing in whatever yep. environment we're working together. 
and every month I get a new crop of people who have no idea what they're doing. Uh, yeah. So I feel like <laughs> my liability is significantly lessened, yeah. right, by having <laughs> experienced PAs and NPs who not only know, you know, about the practice of whatever, whatever field we're working in at the time, but they also know about the idiosyncrasies of the physicians with whom they practice, who's really good, who's a little, a little dicey, you know. <laughs> the residents don't know that stuff. The residents uh, and, the, and the interns don't know that stuff. And that's fun and exciting to be a part of their education. And our PAs and NPs are a big part of their education, actually, in our, in our shop. Um, but that's a huge advantage, in my view. And it's actually a huge liability reduction to have people that are dedicated to emergency care or dedicated to critical care that know what the hell they're doing. And you, to speak on how can they be best utilized, were you going to address that? Or? Well, no, I was going to basically say six years ago when we started this course, this question about uh, PAs and NPs uh, having some issues with regarding taking jobs. That, that, was, that was no discussion on that at that time. There is now, and there, but the tension is not just with PAs and MPs. The tension is also about people saying we're creating too many board certified emergency departments and there's too many residencies in emergency medicine uh, popping up and there's gonna be uh, re uh, more and more uh, residents out there who will lower the salaries of the already doc uh, working doctors because they're willing to work for less. And so I, there's been a number of uh, editorials written about that, or commentaries at least. I guess you, I hope you guys know that you can, you can bill your services to Medicare or insurance companies, but you'll get 80% of what a doctor gets. And there are a number, and so that's a loss of money to the hospital. Uh, and there's huge fraud going on, and I bet, I'm sure some of you work in this, this situation, where they, they, you see a patient, the doctor doesn't write anything in the chart, and they bill it at the doctor's fee. That's absolute fraud, right. and that's millions and millions of dollars in fines. And for some reason, yeah. I mean, there's numerous hospitals are still doing that. I don't get it. I thought it's, the law changed on this. No? No, it hasn't. The uh, doctor has to I, write I, a note on the chart and take responsibility for seeing the patient. And in order to, they don't have to do much, but they can't have nothing on there yeah. uh, and say uh, that this is a doctor fee. Although there is a major move to get rid of the 85% and move it up to 100 right now in Congress. Whoever makes this regulation, their, their people are saying, well, we get the same outcome, we do the same work, and why are you paying us less? And so that is very uh, powerful. Um, the only women should be paid less, I think, not the parents. Right? Jesus Christ. We always have to it, do something. This is, this is a, a slippery slope, indeed. And this last part of the question, how can they be best utilized? Well, that's really dependent on where you work. So it's very different uh, utilizing a nurse practitioner or a PA in a site that's rural or a trauma center or fast track only. And are you really only seeing fast track patients in the trauma center? No. I mean, you're getting sick people there, too. And then you get backed up and they expect you to still see the fast track patients. And, you know, it, it's a difficult uh, situation to be in sometimes. And it really, you know, best utilized, it's where the team is the most effective. You know, you're seeing patients, the doctors that you work with will say, hey, I'm gonna go see these two sick people. I need you to pop in a, in a line in this really critically ill patient, but can you see this eye pain? You know, the communication is the key there. And also, as you know, Diane mentioned, knowing your limitations. So if you don't feel comfortable doing something or you haven't been trained, then you need to ask and escalate that. You don't wanna work in a place where you're seeing the minor cases all the time. Yeah. You wanna be able to see anybody in that department so that your skills are increased, your knowledge and experience is increased. I mean, it's not a, going to be a career if you're just seeing the Although minor Although you cases. also don't want to be thrown into that on purpose. So I think one of the temptations in groups that hire um, advanced practice clinicians is to just throw them into the pool no matter what your experience. And that puts you in an incredibly untenable position. Did, did, did you say advanced practice clinicians? I did. I got a, I got a convert. And with that, we will go to lunch. <laughs> okay. Enjoy your lunch.